Okay, so good morning again to some of you. Um, this morning we'll have a lecture by uh, Godelie van Hetera. I guess Godelie will introduce herself uh, to you. Um, and um, <laughs> there's the picture. Uh, and, and so we really try to, to have this as a interactive session. So as Godelieve already posted in the chat, please try to be as interactive as you can be. And there will be lots of questions, no wrong answers. Um, and I will have to share the presentation for, uh, for Godelieve. So I will... Um, get the PowerPoint up. Anyway, Jan, while you're doing this, um, I'm just gonna, hi, good morning, everybody. I was putting my face uh, behind the screen because I slept at four in the morning. So my head is a bit like a stone. They had a, a rave party uh, at the back of my, uh, my street. So uh, until uh, 4.30, <laughs> a lot of people were having a good time. Uh, but anyway, good morning uh, to everybody, good afternoon. Um, very nice to see you all. It's a bit weird to talk in a Zoom uh, meeting while normally uh, we do all this thing face to face and then we can be much more quick and interactive. Uh, like Jan said, um, I think it is very important that we do this, uh, this uh, couple of hours together. We, we try to do this in an interactive fashion. Um, I'll tell a little bit about myself. I actually used to be the director of Rotterdam Global Health Initiative at Erasmus. So I was the, the global health uh, director until a couple of years ago. My background is as a physician. Um, I've worked um, as a parliamentarian. I was an MP for a while. Um, I started as a physician, wanted to be a tropical medicine doctor, um, but then realized very quickly that uh, um, in the background of so many diseases, there are all these other factors, and I, I got more interested in health systems. Um, so I became a university professor for a while, an assistant professor at the Radboud, and then um, in 2001 was asked to stand for parliament, so I was an MP with a big uh, international portfolio and also including health. Um, in 2007, I left the parliament and then became a director of Cordate as an international development organization that was a temporary contract, but very interesting to see how a large organization like that functions. Um, and then after Cordate, I became the director of Erasmus Global Health, um, which I was until 2016-17, um, when uh, the WHO asked me to help build um, a global governance network. So I, I moved um, as an international expert to the WHO, um, but have always on the side been doing work in what is called performance-based financing. So that is a health systems reform agenda. So I have a lot of practical experience in, uh, in about 30 countries by now. Um, work for the World Bank, for the WHO, for the Global Fund. Um, and it combines all my passions because it is uh, about governance, about transformation and change. Um, and so it's a little bit from that experience that I would like to uh, just discuss with you. Um, and um, we'll, we'll have to see, I mean, basically, if you want to say something, just unmute yourself, not with 100 at once. And you can, you can intervene, it's no problem, uh, because the way this is set up is I have a few um, things I want to share. So uh, the, the, the presentation or the, the interaction is called uh, Global Health Foundations, Challenges and Reset, um, because I think we do live in, uh, in pretty fundamental times. Um, and I want to uh, see how you feel about this. Uh, plus, you know, you're much younger than me, so you will much live much longer. Um, so probably a lot of the changes that are now in the making, you will actually be uh, the leaders of. So let's let's see how uh, how we can work together here. Uh, so Jan, the next slide, please. So we're, we're at this crossroads. <laughs> this is always this is a really stupid slide. Uh, we're always between the, the past and the future. Um, so the now is, is now, but the moment I say now, it's already the past. Um, so we're, we're moving to a future, and at the moment, for a lot of people, that future does not look very clear. Um, there are times when things are calmer and people think they can do 10-year plannings. Um, at the moment, I think it's very hard to predict what next year will bring. Um, 
but that also means that that you you can try to strategize a little bit uh, and and try to get at more foundational work um, and we all feel i think a lot of us feel uh, that this is needed so i want to test a little bit uh, so let's the next slide a little bit how you uh, how you feel about things um basically um, these are my four sort of entry points. So I, I'd like to, to give five questions to you, um, then talk a little bit about is global health really challenged now with this COVID? Um, uh, I will talk about the necessity for some reset, uh, and I will talk about what are global health transformations and foundations. Um, and basically my thesis will be that yes, we need to transform and we need to fundamentally reset, but there's also a lot of good work that has already been done. Uh, we're, we're not starting from zero and we should not start from zero again. Uh, so we should keep the things that have been uh, built over years, sometimes with a lot of, uh, with a lot of deep discussion and a deep action. So um, next slide. So let's move to the next one. So I want you quickly to do this, to wake everybody up because I saw some sleepy faces like my own. Uh, if you at this moment were invited to to write as a young professional to ask to write a, a blog about new global health for the future and you had to write this within the next hour what theme would you pick up so what would you really like to write about today and i just want to get short answers so your first thing you have already been now in this course for a few days but you know, your interest what what today would you like to write about if somebody asks you write about global health for the future Rick, I see you on my screen. Maybe I can just start with you. You have to unmute yourself. Everybody has just to unmute yeah. themselves. Uh, good question. Um, I think the most obvious thing to choose would be the effects of uh, COVID on uh, everybody's lives. And then I would like to expand that to the effects on me of mental health uh, on young individuals. Okay, COVID and mental health. Good. Yeah. That's short, as short as Rick is. Uh, Kevin, you're also on my screen, so I, the people on my screen are the victims. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I would make a blog about uh, maybe the politics uh, involving Corona uh, policies that uh, some countries uh, have different approaches to how to cope with. Uh, Corona, and that's what I would be interested in to block, I think. Okay, so coping and politics. Yes. Then I see Roseanne. Um, I think I will write about um, patience and um, going back in society after the day, after COVID-19, something like that. What do, what do you mean by going back in society? Um, after they have recovered, you mean? Yes, after they're recovering. Okay. So how to return? Because yes, we do hear a lot of stories of people who have actually, you know, been cured. But when they go back, people treat them like they have some uh, <laughs> sort of contagion forever. Yes. Uh, so yes, yes. There, I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff around that. That's a good thing. Max, I see you. Um. I, I would probably not go with the COVID uh, block, but with an, another subject, maybe the other problems in global health, which everyone is kind of forgetting right now. Can I have an applause for Max? Can everybody do have a digital applause? Because I think it's very good. We don't need to uh, you know, really get stuck in this COVID. I'm, I'm very much with you, Max. You have a bonus point for me. So Danielle was also smiling. So I think you know, I'm mean, not going to do the 92, everybody, but I, you know, I picked the victims that are on my screen now. So Danielle. Um, I think I would talk about vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what specifically, but in developing countries, kind of. Okay. And why does that interest you? Um, because primary prevention or secondary, I don't know for yeah. sure which one it was anymore uh, it's very important um to prevent diseases yeah i think it can work both in primary and secondary prevention but you know yes and so this is also way beyond COVID. 
a vaccination, very important thing. So anybody who will have a sleepless night, if I don't let them speak now, can now come in and then we move to the second question. So if there's anybody who just wants to say something now, here's your moment. Unmute yourself and talk. I see people take coffee, so I, I assume everybody <laughs> is happy not to speak as yet. But you won't escape me. Uh, we'll move to the next slide. So global health. Now, I'm, I was already very happy that somebody said, uh, you know, we, it's not just COVID. Everybody is in COVID mood, of course, now. But what is global health for you and what is it to you? Uh, so definitions, there's all kinds of uh, textbook definitions. But what is it really to you? Um, can I just have some views? Marit, can I hear your... You just took a sip, so your throat is clear. Well, um, I think it's about the health of the people around me and in my country and the countries around me. Um, so yeah, that's really important because if they're healthy, um, the economy is good um, and that affects all of us. Okay, so basically for you, it's not like poor countries. Basically, it's the health of everybody. Yes. Yeah, very good. Now, Julian. Um, for me, it feels like um, it's just international cooperation between countries to promote the help everywhere and not only um, stopping at borders, but expanding uh, to other countries. Okay, so it is, it is going beyond borders. Yes. Really. Yeah. Manon. I think it's um, international cooperation in order to provide um, a minimal health care for everyone. Um, and I think everyone deserves the same health standards around the world. Yeah. Why do you find it important? I mean, you wouldn't be in this course if you didn't find it important. So why, why do you find it important personally? I find it important because, um, well, we only know about uh, Western society um, at most. and um, I think it's important for everyone around the world. Um, we're all humans and everyone deserves uh, yeah, basic uh, necessities. Okay, so for you it's a way to reach out beyond yourself and beyond your own cultural bubble. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Now, Tom. Uh, Maybe there are more I, Toms, but I see one Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think global health is um, that you get healthcare in every country, uh, the same healthcare, and that it's that there are no differences between, uh, for instance, uh, countries in Africa and in Europe. Okay, so. have you have you traveled to other places? Have you compared a little bit yourself? Uh, yeah, I've been to Asia. In Asia, so you have seen differences between our health system and the same yeah, health yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, you see there. it. Yeah. yeah. Mostly like the, the primary care is uh, a lot better, better here than in uh, mm. Asia, for instance. Mm. Yeah, you see quite a lot of basic differences. Eh? If you uh, give you a little example, I work a lot in Ethiopia these days and I've worked in Nigeria over the last couple of years and you, you come in health facilities where there's not even running water, uh, not even running water. So, okay, um, I think, you know, people, what I like about your answers is so far that you want to venture out beyond your own bubbles and, and move into something new and also compare uh, and make sure that people have access to uh, to similar things a similar level of of quality that's very good now the next uh, the next uh, slide jump um let's take the second part of this question why do you think it's relevant or do you think global health is relevant global health is a field of of study and work do you think it's relevant? Valérie, I see you now in the corner of my screen. Valérie Hellenius. Hi, um, I think it's relevant in the world today because um, every day uh, you encounter people that come from part of the world where, um, well, global health is, of, well, where the health is different than in our country. Um, yeah, it's something that you encounter every day. Um, and that you read about every day and uh, when you travel somewhere or yeah i think yeah. in that way you 
it is across the world and it is for everybody healthcare and it is also it doesn't stop at borders it is yeah. it's for everybody yes okay leonard you have a very good headset i can see and a good background uh, i'm of study backgrounds as well here yeah i'm at my mother's house so oh very um, good yeah i think it's very relevant um uh for me it's mainly about bringing knowledge and technology um well from richer countries to the poorer part of the world um and yeah this is very uh relevant in the sense that the knowledge is already there it simply has to be transformed to other people yeah so you you say we can do much smarter with sharing knowledge technologies around the world also bringing it from places where it's already very developed to places where it might not be so developed yet yeah, but I yeah. think yeah, and and you're you're interested in technology yourself. That's something you find important. Well, not not mainly um, technology, but like um, well, technology in health. I mean, so um, of course, knowledge is very important. But at some point, you're going to to need CT scans in mm. those countries to. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to talk more. I see many more people. Is there anybody who I don't see on my screen who now wants to come in? Just unmute yourself and say if you want to say, otherwise we move to the next one. I'll give you five seconds. People feel they have burning things to share. If not, because I cannot see all the names in one go, so I cannot see raised hands and all that. So you really have to intervene yourself. Anyway, next slide. So what do you think global health as a field of work? What history and values do you think it's, it's mostly based on? Where does this come from, this global health? And what values are important? So I see Minte is now right ahead of me. Minte to her. Um, I think in addition to what was said to the last question is that um, uh, higher income countries have the resources to help Um, knowing that you're in a position to help others and using that position. Okay, so that what what value would you? How would you call that value? It's the value of solidarity, or what? What what would it be? Yeah, the name? yeah. I guess you could say it like that. Okay, uh, because we're looking for value words. So, uh, Janira, what what kind of value you think is is global health based on? I think it's just. Um, Generally, knowing that as human beings, like you want to protect your own family, you want to see other people that are healthy. And uh, because of globalization, you're traveling more, you're seeing more people and maybe they don't have the same like um, stuff that could help them regarding health. And that it's just a human uh, feeling to want to help someone else. Okay, so here I hear two values. Actually, I hear sort of compassion with people and i hear that you want to venture out beyond your own bubble so let's say in equity yeah? the equity is that you want everybody to in a way have the same possibilities yeah. um, so your family of course is close to you but you also want to venture out to to larger let's have one more marike marike Wiebes. yeah i think as well equity and equality equality yeah. for you is also one of the values for global health well, we've seen, of course, uh, thanks ever to everybody for these answers. Next, uh, next uh, question. So what's problematic about global health? This is what we and what how we think global health has been impacted. This is what we're going to talk about. So I leave that a little bit now up in the air. So let's move to the next slide. Um, because the first real conversation after this little intro is really what do you think has really been challenged by COVID? Uh, and do you think global health has really been challenged by COVID? So before we move to the next slide, I want to hear some, some impressions. People, do you think from what you know and what you've seen and what you've heard? So Luca, Luca Jongen, do you think that global health has really been challenged by COVID? You have to unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I uh, I really think uh, uh, that uh, changed our whole point of view of uh, how we look to uh, to global health because um, we are now um, 
uh, really, how do you say it? Um, yeah. In Dutch we say, um, well, met the, met the nose of the feiten gedrukt, zeg maar. So we've really been confronted with, yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. the raw facts of life. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I think that was, that's really the case. Okay, so it, it's been an eye-opener for many yeah. people. Yes. Okay, but has it fundamentally challenged in the sense of were these things not there before? Sorry? The, these, these things that people now are aware of. Yeah. Were these things new or are they are they things that have been there but people have just not been watching? Yeah, yeah, that's the I think they, they were yeah. already there but people were not aware of them until yeah. COVID-19. Yeah. So who who agrees with that? Who also says yeah, a lot of things were already there but now it's like people have been put with their face right into the right into the mud. Who agrees with that? You just wave hands if you agree with that. That a lot of the things that we now see were not new. They were there before, but now we see them. Just just raise hands if you feel that that's the case. I see some hands. I see also some people not raising hands. So let me have one who's not. Lotte is raising half a hand. Anika is kind of thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, some of your screen is a little uh, higher than what, uh, what I can see. Okay, um, so this is what we're going to discuss now in the next uh, couple of minutes. So next slide. Yeah, so everybody should be on mute unless they want to speak. So... Uh, was COVID a surprise? No, of course not. And, and as, as health people or health related people, you all know that. And we know these viruses, these coronaviruses have been around for quite a while. Uh, the animal kingdom is full of viruses. There's all kinds of other. Uh, so pandemics. Um, just the other day I was watching this film Contagion. Has anybody seen it on TV? I mean, it was a film of 2011. And it is like the COVID ep epidemic. It's really... So a lot of people have been thinking about the possibility of a pandemic. And this is why in the international world, in 2005 already, there were international health regulations set up. There was an agreement of all the WHO member states of the UN to work together for global health security and preparedness because people were already working with scenarios of pandemics. And so we cannot say um, as, as scientific people uh, or people in the, in the health arena, that this was totally unforeseen. But of course, it always hits you on an unpleasant moment. And so the WHO strategy at the moment, so they have these multi-annual strategies already. A few years back, they made this strategy. and They put one billion of the three billion budget they put into preparing for security risk and, and pandemics. So a lot of people were already thinking um, this might hit us at some point. And we had, of course, the smaller epidemics in recent years of the Ebola, and, and of course the earlier SARS epidemic. So it's not like a new thing. So is it a surprise? No. So in that sense, uh, nothing new, but of course um, what became a bit uh, pressing was the size and the, and the scale of it. Okay, next one. So similar things about the COVID response. And so it has, exposed quite a lot of things and, and to tell you a little bit of my personal sort of involvement I've I, I'm working for the WHO Health Systems Governance Collaborative which deals very much with health governance and they've been looking at comparing countries for preparedness and for all kinds of governance things uh, already for years um, um, and we're looking already at, at how are countries ready uh, to deal with certain things. Now, like some of you said in the introduction, if you go from country to country, there's huge differences, as we all know, uh, on the world, uh, in the world about how people uh, are prepared uh, and also can be prepared given their economic uh, status. So, spotlights have been put on the political choices regarding health and wealth, regarding economy, social systems. Uh, so, if you go look, look at China, it's a very different political system than, for instance, uh, the United States or for instance, France, or for instance, uh, Nigeria. Uh, at the same time, we've also realized now, and this was not new, but everybody's now aware that we're so connected to each other. Everybody is connected through trade, uh, through mobility, through media. As, and, and this sounds like a slogan, but I think now everybody knows 
uh, that certain products are not being made if, if there's travel restrictions, that you know, certain supply chains are being disrupted, that, that uh, all kinds of things cannot happen, and you see the economic effects. Now, another thing that has become painfully clear is that some institutions that we have and that we were trusting are sometimes not really capable of dealing with something at this, this scale. And so many global and national institutions, I mean, in the Netherlands, we've had these discussions about is the GGD ready to do the testing? Um, in other countries, you have similar discussions. Uh, are the nursing homes, were they not prepared to deal with this, with the elderly people? And so many institutions that normally on a good day uh, we trust, all of a sudden they've become exposed for their weaknesses and, and certain things that are difficult. So this is all over the world. People see this now. Every country you look at, people have these discussions. And then there's major differences between nations in economic resilience. So for instance, what the European Union could do, what countries here could do and support income and give subsidies to people and to companies, etc. Not all the, all the countries in the world can do that. And so if you live in a part of the world where there's a little bit of a deep pocket and the state can pay for a lot of things, then you're, you're slightly better off now than when you live in a country that is already poor, like Ethiopia, for instance, or where I'm currently working and where some of these African countries, they're pushed back into poverty. And some of these countries had come out recently out of poverty. A lot of people were moving to a better economic situation. And now all of a sudden, because of the COVID, uh, markets are stopped, people were restricted in their travel, uh, and, and simple people who have just little products that they, can, uh, that they can produce and share on the market, they had to stay home, and so their little income was, was being su suppressed, and the government cannot pay. So I think there's huge differences, and these are the painful differences that we know in the world to exist, and nothing of this is new, uh, but now nobody can deny uh, that this is a problem. And so the huge inequities between people, and this is not only between countries, but it's also within countries. That are people in our country even that have less, uh, less possibility to survive a few, few months without work. And some other people can just sit at home and do their thing. And so there's even in our countries that are rich, that there is a huge... So this is big spotlight on things that were there before, but nobody can deny them anymore. Is there anybody who wants to comment on this, or is this clear? If it's clear, then we'll move on to the next slide. Another thing, and I think that's important for the rest of our story, which will be about fundamentals of global health, are learning abilities. Because we have all these, uh, these courses and trainings and universities and research centers and, and uh, research institutes and you know, policy institutes. Um, and all that knowledge together, is it good enough? And so what we have seen is that with this COVID, we have, have to, to learn while we're running. Because the epidemic was in the beginning, it was not clear how it would evolve. So while the thing is, is moving, you have to learn very fast. Now, the capacity to learn fast is something that some institutions do not have. Some institutions are very slow. Uh, they, they are slow and stately and they, they learn step by step. Uh, but here, people had to learn very fast. So you remember in the beginning all these models that came out predicting how many people would be ill and you know, all kinds of different contexts that are there. So it is very, very clear that um, our learning abilities uh, we have fast communication, but our learning abilities are really, uh, really challenged. Sorry, can you move? Yeah, can you move up. Next slide. So a lot of uncertainties. That was the so we have we have the inequities, we have the learning, and we have the uncertainties. The uncertainties were also extremely uh, clear and are still there. Uh, and I don't know how you personally feel uncertain or not uncertain about this whole situation. I mean, it has affected your lives. I mean, you're now sitting at home, all this stuff. Uh, but for a lot of people, uh, like the virology was in the beginning uncertain. Uh, what would, how would this virus behave? How would it spread? How contagious would it be? Um, all kinds of capacities of the health systems, bottlenecks, uh, the ICUs that were overstretched, the nursing homes, uh, the chronic care institutions. Vaccination, we're still in the middle of this discussion about you know, which vaccine will work for whom and when and, and how long and 
is it being pushed and you know are there the lobbies that push these things onto the markets before we know it uh, and, and is this safe so huge uncertainty all kinds of prevention regimes so there was one of you who said i want to to study more prevention very important uh, so what type of prevention can we actually now talk about given the nature and the, the multi dimensions of this uh, of this pandemic uh, for instance I, I as i told you i work a lot in africa so i was working in nigeria at the moment that the COVID uh, things were being introduced there and a lot of people in nigeria the 60 percent of people they live on one dollar a day so it is not possible for them to not sell their little products and, and just stay at home they have no reserves so when the lockdown came, these people that normally were healthy, they were not infected at that time, they said, but there's no way I'm going to stay at home because I will die of famine. <laughs> you know, I will not. So if you live in those types of circumstances, you, you have to really talk about prevention it cannot be one size fits all. It has to be really catered for the different circumstances. And we see this even in Europe. Eh? If you go to France, the lockdown was much more strict than, for instance, here in the Netherlands. If you go to Sweden, it is more liberal than here in the Netherlands. So countries figure out what the balance should be. Now, this is, comes with a lot of uncertainty because when people look on the internet and they live in, in, in France and they say, well, the Dutch, uh, they, have, they have much uh, lean, more lenient measures than we have. Uh, the French could not go out more than 800 meters out of their house. They could basically had to fill out forms. There was police on the street that would stop them at every corner if they were walking with more than two people. Uh, in the Netherlands, it was in that sense a little bit more, you know, relaxed. Uh, and so what type of prevention works and what type of prevention works in, in each country? And then, of course, the economic fallout that started to happen. So you can see uh, this is just part of the list, but the huge uncertainties of all this. I was at the IMF meeting when they predicted in April what the effects would be. In June, they already had to, to uh, reassess uh, the economic fallout effects of this pandemic, and so the, the macroeconomic effects on a lot of countries. So this means that you have to learn fast, you have to act fast, you have to think fast, you have to be on your feet, and you have to think in terms of complex situations. Now, for most people, that is tough. Who of you says, you know, the more complex it becomes, the more I enjoy a problem. I actually like complexity. I like to think about things that are not just simple. Can I see hands? Are there people amongst you who say, yeah, give me a nice complex problem. I like to put my teeth into it like a puzzle. Can I see hands? Anika, I see you smile. You like, you like complex things or you like simple? Um, I like complex things as long as I can... Handle them. them, I guess. <laughs> but when they're too complex, I don't like it anymore. <laughs> so I think okay. a little bit in the middle. In the middle. Okay, Inge, I see you're <laughs> thinking. So you like complex or you like simple? I do like complex problems, um, but I think the same. As long as I can fix them, eventually I like complex problems. But okay, so how patient are you to fix complex problems? Because now time comes in as well. Eh? And, and you know, I'm not saying this flippantly. A lot of these things take time and sometimes time is not there, which makes it extra difficult. Um, um, if it's a problem I'm really is interested in, I, time is not a... It's not an issue. Uh, yeah. Good. No, but that's good. Anybody else who, who really, because I want to hear who are the scientists among you. Scientists tend to like... Max uh, has raised his hand. So okay, Max, uh, Max, come in. Max, you have to unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I like uh, an uh, challenge, I think. Uh, complexity. Um, yeah, I like, I like that. So, Okay, and so for you also, okay. if something's complex, you don't mind to, to go into different dimensions of something and figure it out? No. Okay. No. Anybody else who feels I'm the scientist, uh, my scientist nature is coming out now? Can I perhaps add on that, Godelier? Uh, yeah, please. Because I'm, I'm, as well as in education, still a clinical doctor. Uh, and, and of course, if you work at Rostov Medical Center, you take care for complex cases. 
Uh, at least that's what the health insurance pays us for to do. Um, so uh, that's nice to do. But but if you work with complex cases, you try to break them down in small, simple parts. Um, and, and clinical doctors are very uh, simple because they want to treat and care for a patient. Uh, and thereby a complex, case, complex patient, you try to pull it apart into very simple, uh, small things which you can take care of and then take care of the patient. So, Yeah, so I, I, what Jan is saying is very important. Uh, so once you have a complex problem, then very often you cannot solve it all by yourself. So you need to start to work uh, with other people. And this is what you see, of course, you need to start to collaborate, uh, break the problem down into things, but also have coordination uh, between all these various elements and between people who work on them. And so if you think about, uh, I, I'm not a sort of PR official for the WHO, but if you think of the level of complexity that this COVID poses, uh, they have to treat the whole world, they have to have guidance, give guidance for the whole world. They have to deal with all the developments that are happening all around the clock. Um, so the level of complexity is huge. And so behind the faces that you see in the press conferences, like Dr. Tedros and, and uh, uh, Mike Ryan, and those doctors, uh, basically there's teams working like 24 uh, seven to, to get all these different elements put into guidance that makes sense to people to fix things. And so I, I, I'm always, you know, with these types of things, I'm, I'm very modest in my criticism of, because I know how, how, difficult it is to get all these things together. And it's much more simple if you say, okay, I, uh, I boil an egg and I eat an egg, that is, that is a simple action. But this, this is of a level of complexity that is huge. But if you like it, it's very exciting to, to watch you know, because it, it tells a lot about how human nature is and how, how our systems and how our world is actually functioning. So for the global health arena, I think this has been a huge exposure. Um, can I have the next slide? And so this complicates everything, of course, because while we have some, some, let's say, more serious experts working and serious practitioners, we also have a lot of self-appointed experts on the internet who have the, the, the one-size-fix-all solution for everybody or who are there to tell that nobody is uh, understanding this except themselves. Um, and you, know, you can get very tired of, uh, of that. And of course, there's a lot of information, also solid information circulating to make sense of that. It's a little bit help like you see in this slide. Okay, let's move to the next one. So while all this is going on, so we see huge complexity, we see a lot of new learning, etc. Has global, this COVID, has it really shaken the foundations of global health? So we come back to the core question. Do you think it really has shaken the foundations of global health? If you see uh, all the, the, the new, awareness that's coming out, does that touch or sense of the foundations of global health? Whom can I give the floor? Well, um, I think uh, maybe um, now that people see that uh, a disease that uh, is very far away and <clears throat> on the other side of the world can actually affect them, maybe then uh, the priority is more on uh, on solving diseases in other countries, I mean, I think that has big, uh, a big, um, it's going to make a big difference on uh, the combating diseases like uh, HIV and Ebola, because people now understand that that disease can also come to their home. Yes, so this is this is one big difference that people are now more aware, and we hope, we hope, we still have to see whether it's the case. We hope that that awareness in everybody around the world will lead to an understanding that we're all in this boat together. And that if somebody uh, sneezes in China, we can all get ill. And so basically that's that awareness, which of course, again, is nothing new, but we hope that that will lead to changes in, in also foundations of, of global health. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Leah. You have to unmute yourself better because I don't hear you or your headset or something wrong with it. Okay, well, Leah is trying. Maybe Lian, do you have any answer to this one? 
do you feel all the things that have shifted that that will change the foundations of global health <clears throat> i don't necessarily think that has really changed the foundations of global health but rather uh put them more in the spotlight uh, the values which we discussed earlier i think um are now more relevant than ever so i think people can really see that more clearly and okay. have it demonstrated demonstrated to them okay that might lead by the way to some change yeah? so can we have maybe the next slide so my own answer would also be a little bit yes and no um, and this is now from long experience working in global health this maybe I was thinking the other day that it's maybe now about 20 years I've been working with global health things. Um, and so very few of the things are new, but awareness has been raised and also positive connections have been strengthened. And so we, we see a lot of the negatives, but um, if you look, for instance, at the, at the, the, the collaboration research, uh, the, of course, in the newspapers, you read about all the, the competition between the vaccine groups and you know, the lobbies behind it. But if you look at the research side of vaccine, how people have worked together, how they have shared information, how they have actually changed quite a lot at the speed of light uh, and, and how this is still ongoing, how journals have opened up uh, to, 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 to put uh, have free of charge, put online all the relevant articles so that people can have access to information, that type of sharing is absolutely phenomenal. And in my youth, when I was your age, uh, before internet, uh, <laughs> this would not have been possible. So I'm, I'm in awe, uh, also when I see a WHO, how every day information comes in from all the corners of the world, uh, different things at different levels, practical, scientific, fundamental, shared, shared in the groups, set out immediately, uh, uh, RNA and DNA being shared immediately. So this is absolutely positive. And so in that sense, the foundations can also be positively shaken that all of a sudden the global health arena sees that it, it works on knowledge and it works on, on forms of collaboration that can move very fast if people could get their act together. However, um, in order for that to happen, all these positive things to, to go even further, uh, we have to start to deal with what you also pointed out, all the inequities and all the, all the inequalities that exist in the world uh, and, and link much more enthusiastically with some of the agendas for the future. And so we need to step up this transformation uh, and, and really go into uh, the sort of next stage. And so there is a yes, yeah, there's, there's, there's a shakeup and the shakeup can be positive and negative, but there's also a lot of positives. Uh, but some of the problems were there before, we now just need to start to tackle them. So this is why I want to leave you now for a moment, because I was told that after 45 minutes, people need uh, a coffee break. So about 10 minutes, if that's okay with you. And then we'll come back and talk about how that step up transformation can actually take place uh, and what we can build up, build on in terms of uh, already existing uh, uh, agendas that are there. Uh, so we, we don't start from scratch. Uh, and these are things that you need to know as global health people uh, that are solid foundations that have not been shaken so much and that basically can help us to go also to the next stage. So Jan, I, I, you probably have a little film. So can we have a 10 minute break on my clock? It's now, uh, let's say by, by 12, we're back. Is that okay? Yes, okay. Then we start 12 sharp. 12 sharp? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay everybody, thanks. You.
Nee, over drie minuten gaan we weer verder. Het is even pauze. Okay, if you want to back again, then we would like to start again.
Although a pity to uh, abort uh, such a great song, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good selection. Uh, anyway, generally, I mean, if you talk about some of the good things coming out of COVID, there's great art coming out of COVID. Songs, cabaret, drawings, cartoons, paintings, theater. So um, people are, uh, are very creative by and large. Okay, guys, uh, we're going to move now to the, the next two sessions of our conversation. So where we left um, uh, before the break is, you know, what next? Uh, the transformations that need to take place. Um, and in my own work currently uh, for the WHO, I work for the Health Systems Governance Collaborative, which is one of the UHC uh, platform collaboratives working on governance and we have started with a lot of networks, global networks, this building the reset campaign some months back, already in the beginning of the pandemic, when a lot of people were busy with the emergency. Um, some of us said, well, uh, let those people do their work and uh, keep them in peace. But, but all of us, the rest of us um, that are not uh, at the front line of the emergency work can actually also contribute by starting to think a bit more fundamentally about what we've now seen, all our new awarenesses. So the next slide. And what we all are aware of now um, is that things hang together. And so this is a cartoon that has been uh, broadly circulating on the internet. And so you have the COVID, but then uh, you have economic fallouts, you have big climate effects. Um, so things are not standalone. And basically, a lot of things hang together. Uh, and it means that if we're going to work on the complexity, on this complex um, uh, world we live in, we have to maybe also start working in new ways together. So let's have the next slide. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, could you maybe turn on your camera? Uh, yes. I then it's my... easier to uh, understand. Thank you. Okay. So everybody better now? If I say, if I hear no, no, I understand it's yes. Okay, um, so what, what we did globally was with a lot of people who work in global health and in health systems come together and say, what are things that, that were already ongoing before the COVID, but that we now say, see that we need to fast track, that we need to really move energetically forward. Um, and so seven streams of work were actually uh, identified. This is, none of this, is new work, new in the sense that it was not there before, but everybody feels that this is now where the spotlight needs to move in terms of how we can collaborate together. And I put them here, but it's not in an order of priority. They're all interlinked. Um, so there's an area of work that is called common goods for health. Now that sounds a bit technical, but by that they basically mean um, that certain things just need to be in place and need to be there for everybody in order to have good health. So you have common goods, uh, the, the things that should be there for everybody, uh, independently of where you live, etc. And common goods for health are those things that just need to be there uh, for people to be healthy. So one thing, for instance, is vaccination. The vaccination discussion, a lot of people um, that think this way say vaccines, vaccines are uh, in the area of this needs to be uh, available for people no matter where you're born. Um, so that was one big discussion and that is ongoing and a lot of people um, work in that space. Uh, people work together on different elements of what now needs to be in place for health to be there for everybody. Now the second big area is adaptive systems for health. This came out of all the cri criticism of that certain things were reacting too slow, that uh, institutions were not doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, that the flexibility is not big enough, that some things have become too bureaucratic, um, as we all experience. Um, so adaptivity, uh, how do you adapt to rapidly changing circumstances? That was the second big area. And a lot of people worldwide are now moving in that, in that domain. Now, then there is a large group of people who, who was already working on equity and inequalities. And they also were often working on some people are always setting the agenda and always being heard and other people you never never hear 
And so they say equity and agency, and so the, the power of people to actually be an actor in their own lives or in, in the world, uh, that needs to be upgraded for everybody. So we need to work on equity and we need to make sure that um, all people are heard uh, and not just a few that always uh, are the usual suspects. And that comes with an, an agenda also of breaking down some of these power structures that make that some people are always in power and some people are always um, falling behind. Uh, so this is a, a collective agenda of equity, agency and decolonizing global health. And that's, a, that's a, a growing group of people and also a lot of young people from different parts of the world are very active in this. Uh, and this is like your generation coming up in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in, in uh, parts of Europe and, and, and the States, uh, who say we need to really start to work on equity and, and getting rid of all these crazy differences. Uh, there's always the same people that, that get all the benefits and other people get nothing. So this is quite an active area. Then there are people who say prevention and public health has been long neglected. All the focus in health has gone for a long time to curative care. Uh, but all these things about public health and the conditions uh, in which people live, socioeconomic, uh, that needs to be tackled now with new energy. So that's also a large group of people. And then you have people who say all these large institutions that, uh, that function, uh, like the WHO, uh, but others, uh, they, they need to be really looked at again. Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Uh, because there are not a lot of new players in the global scene. Uh, there's private actors like the Gates Foundations, all these private foundations with a lot of money. Uh, and they can sometimes just set the agenda, which might not necessarily be the agenda for all people. It might just be a commercial agenda. Or uh, So multilateralism is the, the collaboration between the nations and between states and between um, actors that work for the public good. Are they really doing that? Uh, so WHO, as you know, has come under quite a bit of criticism. Some is justified. Uh, some maybe not so, but um, all the multilateral organizations now face uh, this, this criticism because some people feel they have become too much, um, you know, subordinate or, or listening uh, to certain lobbies, etc. So we need to really look at which international institutions are actually doing things for people and not just for some lobby group or for some interest. Now, and then there is a fantastic new field where it's also a lot of people of your generation are actively involved in. It's called planetary health. So this is not just climate, but it is basically everything that links on the planet uh, to informal ecosystems. Uh, and, and there, a lot of people feel this is really the next frontier. This is where we all need to move global health people uh, because we need to start interlinking health with all the things with which it hangs together with our ecosystems, with our food systems, with our economic systems, and planetary health is, is that domain. And then finally, um, there's a group of people who says, we also need to watch out and that we connect between all these areas and that we make sure that this crisis is not being abused uh, by some forces with deep pockets who say, okay, let's now uh, push, uh, let's, let's say certain things into the world uh, because everybody is in, in chaos and in turmoil. Uh, and so we can now push our thing. And so there's people, critical people who, who watch uh, and watch which forces are actually setting the agendas and whether these agendas are there for the benefit of uh, humanity or whether they're there for the benefit of a few people. So these are the, the seven sort of large agendas that a lot, a lot, a lot of people in global health now work on. And uh, I, I flagged them here because um, I think it's, it's also for your generation, if you are going to move further in global health, of course, you, you can do that as a doctor or as a, as a public health person, but you can also move into other domains because what you will see in your generation, and that is, is already uh, has been ongoing for a while, but it will now be really fast, things will start to move in much greater interaction. And, and I, I find it personally, I'm, I'm a bit sad that I'm already, you know, so old because basically uh, I would love to be like 25, 30 now. Um, because I think we're, we're, if, if you see these developments and you see the potentials, there's actually a lot of very good work that can be done. So all of you interested in global health, uh, look, maybe we did webinars with, uh, with our team on some of these, the, the first five. Uh, and in the coming weeks there will be two more um, so i put the links in the in the chat box 
So if you want to look at some of these webinars that we did around these themes and, and the kind of topics that, that are being discussed, please uh, you know, feel, uh, feel free to, uh, to join. And if you want any further information on any of these uh, campaign elements, uh, just let me know. But I thought to flag this to you to show that out of this COVID, some real transformation can come. Now, the next slide. Are we starting from zero? And here I'm going to do a little bit of, it might sound maybe a bit tough and I'll try to click to these slides quickly. I'll share the slides uh, with, uh, with Jan um, afterwards so you, you can have them. Um, but I want to also acknowledge that there are a lot of very, very serious work to build foundations for these same agendas that I just discussed for equity, for, for human rights have been built already since decades. And so there have been serious people working for decades on some of these topics. Uh, and I, next slide, I want to draw out a few, just to give you a bit of an impression. So some solid foundations of global health are uh, the, the whole legal framework of health as human right. Uh, this is not just a slogan, and we use it in lobbies and, and advocacy and in uh, demonstrations, uh, health is a human right. But basically, health as a human right refers to a whole legal buildup since the 40s uh, of, of giving health a status that you can legally, um, legally uh, refer to. And this is very important, especially in countries where, where health is being jeopardized by all kinds of, uh, by all kinds of uh, faulty practices. So the second, and this I'll click to very quickly, I put a lot of slides in, but I'll, I'll keep it short here because you probably hear, heard a lot of, about this already. But of course, we live in the era of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, with as one of the important health goals, the Universal Health Coverage Agenda. And this basically means that the UN in 2015 has decided we are going to set for 15 years an agenda where we link all the development goals together. And we'll talk about this a little more. And now with the COVID, it's become very, very clear that this agenda is actually important as well. It was already important, but the fact that, that food and education and nutrition and ecology and how we work together and economy, it all links together. So health is not standalone. It is linked to all these other factors. And then finally, I'll say a little bit about health uh, as a common good, but that will be short. And then the foundational changes that we need, I already drew out two, but um, uh, drew out the seven, but two I'll, I'll focus on a bit more. That's planetary health, because I think that is the field that all of you should become familiar with. I think that's the future. And decolonizing global health, that is basically get rid of all these old attitudes that are hindering progress. And by old attitudes, I mean that people in certain parts of the world think they're better than other parts of the world, that people of certain backgrounds think they're better than other people, um, and there are institutions that, that reproduce these kinds of inequities constantly. Now, there is a huge movement, and you, you just have to think of Black Lives Matter, but that is just one. There's many, many, many movements like that who say enough is enough. We now live in the 21st century. Time is up, and we're going to do it differently. That is the agenda in global health. It's called decolonizing global health. If you Google it, you find all the fora that are hugely active. Uh, and um, if, again, I were 30, I would become like full-time involved with that because I think it's absolutely these last two, uh, planetary health and decolonizing global health, they're really the future. And so I hope that many of you move uh, and, and start to get familiar with, with uh, and it's, it's also, it's, it's really energetic. A lot of good things are happening there. So let's move to the next slide. So health is human right. And I'll quickly click you and I'll, I'll say to Jan, quickly click, click. We're not gonna go into all the footnotes of these slides. I'll share them with you, but I just want to give you some highlights of this health is human right agenda. So next one, that's really foundational. So we really need to build, uh, or even today with all the turbulence and all the chaos, we can still built on this strong agenda. And so in all kinds of treaties, conventions, international agreements, health is built in as a human right. So this was also referred to in the COVID time. So if somebody says, well, we give the vaccine only to certain people, you will see that there will be course cases, court cases that refer to health as a human right. You cannot just give something to just a few people and not to the rest. But this is not possible. So there, this is a really a legal, a legal background, which is very rich in detail and conventions and laws. 
Uh, but it started uh, it started about uh, 75 years ago. So let's let's move. Uh, and, and many many people have said this. And so of all the forms of inequity and injustice in healthcare, the, the injustice in healthcare is the most shocking because I think across the world, if you talk to people, most people will agree very quickly uh, that health is for everybody. It's not just for uh, uh, the happy few. It should be for everybody. Okay, next one. So here's the famous declaration. Um, I assume all of you in your secondary school probably already heard about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So after the Second World War, uh, it was very clear that, that the whole world was coming together saying, you know, we cannot have a kind of disaster as that war was, and that was man-made disaster. Um, we have to somehow come with rights for all human beings. Uh, and so they, they made this declaration initially uh, in 1948. Next slide. Now, this is just a bad photo of uh, this man-made disaster, the Second World War. This was the bombing of Stalingrad at the time. Um, and that was, you know, it, it, it really destroyed the city. It's a little bit like what you now see happen in Lebanon with this chemical explosion. It was, but this was the whole city was, was bombed, a bit like the center of Rotterdam was bombed. So people came out of this type of disaster with a lot of human tragedy, with the Holocaust. So all the misery that people had experienced, five, six, seven years of it. So they said, enough is enough. You really need to come together as humanity. It was that sort of moment. So next slide. And already in the, in the lead up to this human rights declaration, because of course that took a little while to, uh, to, uh, to develop as a text, uh, all the countries coming together, talking, trying to talk to each other, preparing. Um, there was already a constitution of this World Health Organization. So after the war, people already said very quickly, we need something that somehow guarantees a right to health. And so the WHO's constitution was already in 1946. So even before the formal declaration of all the human rights, the health right was already articulated in the constitution of this new organization at the time, the WHO. We'll come to the details later, so let's move. So right to health came, was one of the, one of the uh, elements mentioned in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 48. Health is a part of the right to an adequate standard of living. So it was, it was mentioned as part of uh, normal living. That, that was how they formulated it in Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. Let's move. Now, you think, okay, then you have a declaration and then the whole world will change. Now, we all know that that does not happen. So from that moment, 1948, it takes decades to build all kinds of concrete implementation of that right and these universal rights. So this is a photo of the Nuremberg trials. This was after the war, all these guys that had been experimenting in the concentration camps with, with human, uh, with people. And so those people were brought to trial and justifiably so. And a lot of people were, this was still the death penalty was still uh, given. Some of these people were put to death for, for executing these experiments. That started the whole discussion under the, uh, the right to health about we cannot allow people to experiment, even if it's so-called for health reasons, in such uncoordinated ways uh, with other human beings. So that was one element in the implementation of the right to health was to say you have to be safeguarded from these kinds of torturous uh, experiments. Next slide. So you can see the dates here. So remember 46 WHO, 48 Declaration of Human Rights, 64. So about you know, like 18 years after this all happened, this declaration of Helsinki, which actually said guidelines for uh, the guides or to guide research with human subjects came out. So you can imagine in the, in the global arena to get organized and to get something that everybody can sign up to takes a lot of time. And we talked earlier about complexity and time. Now you can see this is complexity and time. 
It takes 20 years almost uh, to get guidelines going. So you declare a health right, and you declare that people should be safeguarded from false experimentation, and then it takes about 20 years to come up with a declaration where everybody signs on, uh, all the people in the world, all the countries. Next one. So in that same year, they also moved another convention because they had this nice general declaration of 48 with all the rights, and just not health, but, but you know, all the other rights as well. But then they started to specify. So again, about in 20 years, they, they made things more specific. So they made a covenant, it's an international sort of legal um, treaty on the economic, social and cultural rights in which health was then put. So they made political rights, next slide. So you have the International Bill of Human Rights and then they made two, two subsections. So a section on political rights uh, with protocols and all kinds of legal stipulations and then one on what they call economic, social and cultural rights and there they put health. So health was considered part of economic, social and cultural rights. So again, 20 years after 48, this came out. So there was an international bill of human rights. You first had a declaration, then you had a bill. So this, this looks maybe totally dull, but if you imagine all the kind of negotiation between all the parts of the world, with all the conflicts that existed, the Cold War that was going on at the same time, and the post-Second World War tensions between nations who had not forgotten what other people had done to them. So all this kind of stuff, happens so they're, they're positive people who say despite the fact that there's been a lot of destruction and, and misery in the world we're going to move to something constructive because as humanity we need to move forward so if you read the details of this and you know if ever you have a moment it reads like a thriller because all these things are you know negotiated out it is really it's it's better than house of cards so let's move to the next one so then you can see that after 66, it took another 10 years to, to 76 before it really started to be signed up. So they make a text for these rights, they put it in a convention, then they go to all the countries and all the countries have to sign it. And only by 2007, so almost like 40 years later, uh, 41 years later, all the UN member states had signed to this right to health in the confident of economic, social and cultural rights. Now there again, if you go into the details of the histories, so you look in how in every country the right to health was discussed in the parliaments, how people talked about it, you see all the diversity between countries. But in the end, 2007, everybody had signed. Uh, and so that that is... And it's a lower figure, you see 157, because there were smaller, there were certain nations were not yet there. There's, there's nations that came in later. So, but basically it takes like 40 years for everybody to agree that now this right to health is in everybody's law. So it, it requires a bit of patience, as you can imagine. But the people who negotiated this were very active in global health. And they were very active in global law. So they, they managed and they got all these countries to, to sign. So let's move. Now, what does uh, this Article 12 in that Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Covenant of the UN actually say? Uh, it, it actually gives, gives states the, the, the stipulations of what they need to do uh, to achieve full realization of the right to health and certain things that they need to do. Uh, so to improve environmental health, uh, prevention, treatment, and control of epidemics should be arranged, creation of conditions which would assure medical services should be arranged. Uh, so an article gives actually instructions to countries what they should do. And if you are a, an, an advocacy organization, let's say you want to work in a country for human rights on the maternal health. Well, let's say you work in a country where maternal health is not so guaranteed. You go to what a country has actually signed, and then basically you can use this Article 12 of this international stipulation, you can use it in court cases and say, you signed up for this. So you cannot, you cannot dug out, you cannot you know, pretend that you're not part of, uh, of this story. 
And so this is, this is a powerful international legal framework now uh, that all kinds of organizations who want to improve on health can use. This is foundational to global health. Let's move. Now, so what's then, of course, was a discussion after had they, everybody had signed up and it was sort of clear that what, what people are supposed to do. Then, of course, it is clear that between countries, not all countries have the same level of technology uh, or the same level of service. Uh, one of you said earlier uh, that bringing technologies to places or helping people develop uh, better, better conditions. So of course, people are aware of these real differences. So they, the, the, the text now reads, the right to the highest attainable standard of health. That means that in each country, you articulate what, given the economic status of that country, is actually possible. And that is what they should do. And so you cannot ask of a very poor country to have all kinds of machinery. Like Nigeria, I give you one example. I was working in Nigeria, I told you in March, when this COVID broke. They had 300 ventilators for a country of 180 million, 190 million people. 300 ventilators. So you cannot say well then everything has to be exactly the same as for instance in the uk or in the uh, in netherlands or whatever and so you have to say okay what is the country's economic status what health can they achieve and that is what they should achieve and for in order to check on these things in 2002 the un appointed a rapporteur um, and that's somebody that goes around and checks in countries whether people really do this. So their highest attainable level of physical and mental health, whether they do what they need to do and can do given their economic status. So this makes a certain kind of sense. And it is, this is being discussed every year because this, this rapporteur reports to the UN. And so you can imagine that every year there's a debate about how countries are moving, if they're moving forward, backwards. And now, of course, after the COVID, we will have to see what the damage has been because some countries were moving very nicely, special countries in Africa, they were moving very nicely economically, and now they're thrown back because of this COVID misery. They're thrown back like maybe 10 years in their development, which is really disastrous. And so the rapporteur will come out and will talk, and most of the time this is at the UN General Assembly, or a little later, so in September, so this month, as some, some of this reporting might, uh, might actually appear. Okay, next one. So this is just a timeline to see how, huh? so there's other treaties. So this was just one set of examples, uh, but you can say racial discrimination also pertains to health, uh, discrimination against women, uh, protection of rights of migrants, very often there are health components there, uh, rights of the child, uh, many, many health related issues around children. Um, a convention of the rights of persons with disabilities, which is one important subsector of, uh, of also health concerns. So if you go and look in detail uh, uh, against the background of this U uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are all these further legal uh, elaborations that have been made. And together that forms a very, very solid set of foundations. So. I know that a lot of people are very sort of critical of the UN and what are they really doing, but if you look at this type of work, uh, without this work, there's no legal ground uh, to fight any case or do any kind of lobbying. So it is very important uh, that this is there, this remains there, and this will now be improved and, and uh, furthered. So let's move to the next one. And here I'm gonna click through. So all kinds of declarations, next one. Uh, it's an inclusive right, so you cannot say um, it, is, it has a lot of other dimensions in it. Uh, so safe drinking water, safe food. Uh, so the, the definition of health is not a narrow definition, it's actually a broad definition that is being used. The next one. Uh, it's, it's, and you see lobby organizations use this. Uh, so this is just a photo of a demonstration. Uh, but basically, uh, housing is a human right, education is a human right, health is a human right, uh, and, and people use this in advocacy and lobby internationally. And it is a solid legal background. Next one. Now, it contains also freedoms. Uh, so 
it's not just the right to have something, but it's also to, to, to be free from something. And like with these experiments, you cannot execute experiments just like that on people. And we have informed consent now, and that is everybody has to, uh, that is uh, the right to be free from torture and other cruel uh, sort of treatments. And it also applies to bad, bad clinical treatments. It's not just experimentation. Uh, but so the right to health contains also I, I, I have the right not to be mistreated and not to be mistreated. Okay, next one. All kinds of entitlements. So you have the right to access to essential medicine. You have the right to maternal, child and reproductive health. You have the right to equal access to basic health services. You have the right to provision of health related education and information. Uh, and you can see that all these elements in themselves are legal backgrounds for if, if ever you as a global health doctor would like to um, get into an advocacy, let's say with the government or you want to uh, promote something, this is a very, very strong framework that you can refer to. Uh, all governments in the world have now signed on to these human rights, so they have to abide by the rules. And, and so it is actually very important. Okay, next one. It's also non-discriminatory. Well, let's click on. I'll share the slides here because it, 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 it's just all these elements that are important to show you how solid that this already is. Uh, and it applies to all services available within the state. Uh, so they must be accessible and acceptable, good quality. Next one. It's not optional. So a country cannot say, well, today I'm not in the mood. You know, basically they've signed on. And this is a fundamental. So human rights are not optional. Yeah, they're, they're solid legal rights. Next one. Next one. So it must be culturally appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, this is all elements. So Jan, Jan, it's good to click on, because I think we got the idea. And I'll share the slides. So what it is not, and that I think is important, is not the right to be healthy. Nobody, of course, can guarantee that you will never be ill. That is impossible for any state. The state cannot guarantee that you're healthy forever. And so it is the right to health and health care, but it's not the right to be healthy. And it's also not something that the state can say, okay, we, we cannot do it now, but we'll do it later. No, every state must make every possible effort to move in the direction of the right to health. So they cannot say, I take a break, you know, come back next year, because it's difficult for us. Even if you're in difficult circumstances, you're not absolved to take the possible action that you can. And for that, it's very important that we have this rapporteur because they, the rapporteur is, is a person, but it's often also a team. And they can advise governments on what's, what is possible within uh, the conditions of a particular country. So you can see this is quite an important uh, right, this right to health. Let's move on. Let's move on. That's linked with other rights, as you can imagine, uh, with water and other stuff uh, like we see. Okay, so this is the right to health. was number one foundation. I'll talk in the, in the remaining time about health system strengthening universal health coverage, the SDGs, also as another dimension of the foundations of global health. Because we need, in the chaos, we need some sort of institutions. So let's have the next slide. So the WHO, but also all other organizations, they have come out and said, in order to have this health right executed, we need to have health systems that actually are functional. So very often when you're a young doctor, you start to work with clinical things. So you, you learn about diseases and about prevention, but you do not necessarily think about the whole environment in which uh, health takes place. That, that is what we call the health system. Now, when I was your age, um, as a young, uh, young doctor, I actually decided after my first job in Mumbai that there were so many issues in the, in the clinic where I was working, this was in the slum, 500,000 people, 
and the slum was surrounded by real slummy conditions. So people were living in, in houses on the cardboard boxes. There was no running water in many places. It was very, the sanitation was awful. A lot of people had no jobs. Um, people were informal workers. So they had the job one day, no job the other day. Um, and so you could see all the reasons why people fell ill. And in the clinic, I felt I was sort of at the wrong side of the wall. I felt I was not on the right side because, you know, I thought I want to do something more uh, yeah, preventative, let's say. So this is, for me, the health systems um, arena became my main sort of specialty. And WHO has actually come out with this building block. So if you talk about health systems, you talk about different things. You talk about uh, the financing of health in general. You talk about uh, the, the service delivery, of course, as uh, so the clinical things are there. You talk about the health workforce, uh, how many people can work in the healthcare system. And when I was working in Mozambique, they only had 150 doctors for a whole country, which is like 2,000 kilometers long. And so that's not enough, as we all know. And so health workforce, if you have no good health workforce, you know, things will go wrong. You need good data and information. So you need a setup for that. And you need products that are valid, not fake. You need vaccines, you need technologies. You need the financing of it all, and you need some leadership uh, for the complexity of all this uh, in order to get improved health uh, and, and uh, improved uh, quality. So this is all these building blocks, they call them the system building blocks of WHO, and they work, work all in interrelation. Now, in the COVID time, everybody's now talking about all these things at once. And so they're talking, if you go online and you look under service delivery, they talk about which services are delivered. And also, like one of you said, which services are not delivered because of the restrictions. In, in, in some of these African countries, more people have now died of malaria than of COVID because of the, the fact that they did not dare to go to the clinic because of the COVID. So then you really start to ask the question in such environments, are the measures not worse than, than the condition? And so service delivery is, is a complex but important thing health workforce now i told you already many places have not enough doctors nurses midwives uh, in in poor countries very often people go to the cities because that is where the work is in the rural areas or the, the more remote areas they are all uh, have, have too little workforce so you find clinics and you you don't find any staff um, information data, we all know all kinds of trouble with that uh, to, to put reliable data into the system. Products, vaccines, money, uh, and then leadership, uh, because also in, in many places, including uh, other parts of the world that are not so poor, uh, there is corruption in many different places as well. And so all these things hang together and they're now being discussed very strongly in the COVID era as well. So this is another domain where a lot of good work has already happened and where if you want to move to global health, you can still choose. So besides your clinical work, if you're interested, you could actually try to move in any of those health systems um, areas and do some research there or even become active. Uh, and uh, as doctors, I think there's always, you always have the advantage that you know the clinical work. And then if you move to the health systems, you, you have like two, uh, you can have two interests. So that is actually, uh, it enlarges your opportunities also on the market and then for work. So that is, that is the universal health coverage WHO. Let's move on. And what we see now, of course, due to the COVID is that this building blocks, of course, are not static. And so all these things are very dynamic. So you need to hear also to start to think in much more complex terms. And so, Health workforce is a very complex thing. So people have, have moved from static thinking to much more dynamic systems thinking, which makes for people who like complexity, this is actually quite nice because there's a lot of very smart people in this field uh, who, who think deeply about such things and you can learn a lot from them. And so the, the values of equity, quality, adaptive efficiency, uh, resilience, being, being ready for, for unsuspected circumstances, all these elements are dynamic um, systems processes. So a lot of work is going on there. Okay, let's move to the next one. Yeah, let's just move. This is just elaborations of the same. Uh, let's move these slides, Jan. Um, Jan. 
next one, next one. It's all kinds of actions. The one I wanted to focus on a bit more is governance, because what we see is there's a lot of knowledge in the world. There's even not a lack of money. If you look worldwide, there's tons of money in global health. But very often things go wrong because there's not good governance. Governance meaning, next slide, that you have proper management, that you have proper accountability, that, that people know what, what's, where the money is going, that you have good legal frameworks. Very often in many parts of the world, including uh, some of the richer parts of the world, the governance is lousy. And so money is there, but it gets lost, it gets wasted, it gets corrupted. Um, and so governance is now, especially in, in these times where a lot of large amounts of money are floating around because of the COVID, we really need to get, keep a very sharp eye. And this is what in part sections of the W show that I work for are doing. I keep a very close eye on where this money is actually going. Is it ending up in the right corners? Is it helping people really? Or is it just ending up in the, ha the hands of some smart lobbies? Uh, and we have these discussions all over uh, with the COVID money because it's, it's huge sums of money that are now circulating. And so your governance is absolutely crucial. Okay, next one. So in summary, uh, for the dimensions of governance, it's, there's all kinds of sides to it. Uh, that things have to be accountable and transparent and you have to make sure that uh, everything is well arranged. So I'll leave this slide in your in your slide set when I share it. Uh, but let's. So there are platforms now that really work on actions in governance because they feel it's important. And one is mentioned here, and some of the links are put in the chat box are webinars that we organized for these uh, for these uh, reset uh, campaign were organized by this Health Systems Governance Collaborative. So that is a collaborative that is very much focused on all these governance dimensions of health systems. Let's move. Let's move. Now, finally, and here I just want to see hands from you. Sustainable development goals. You have heard about that already? Can I see hands of people? Yeah? Everybody has heard of it? Bente, I don't see a hand. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I've heard of it, but I can't really, uh, like... Repeat what it is. Repeat what it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have tens, tens of slides, but I'm not going to show them here, but basically I'm going to tell you. So sustainable development goals, and maybe Naomi can help me, or you also did not know what it was yet. Yeah? So Katerina, you, you raised a hand, so you know what it is. Give me a quick answer to what is the sustainable development goals. I didn't raise my hand. Ah, okay, who did? I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Anybody who raised their hands, I said, I've heard this so many times, I can tell these four guys. Okay, Chris. Um, the sustainable development goals are like goals they made in 2015, I think. And those are some kind of goals they have to achieve by 2030. And it includes also goals for... Uh, health and uh, economy and that kind of stuff. Okay, very good. So yes, Chris is right. Um, you had the Millennium Development Goals. The UN always, uh, the UN family, so all the organizations that are UN, uh, so the Food, and, uh, food uh, Organization, the WHO, uh, so all these UN uh, organizations, they come together uh, at the UN uh, ever so often, and they set goals for a longer time frame for the world. So things that, that uh, need to be developed in the world. So around 2000, we had the Millennium Development Goals. You remember the Millennium, or maybe you don't remember, because maybe some of you were not there yet. But uh, I remember vividly, and they, they set goals, eight goals for the world to achieve by 2015. Now, when 2015 came, it was very clear that these goals had not been achieved, because it, is, of course, takes much more time. So in 2015, they had learned a lot, from that process and they said let's set some more goals and now also be very specific about how all these goals hang together and so they set a goal for health they set a goal for poverty reduction they set a goal for education they set a goal for a range of things so 17 goals and the timeline was that by 2030 these goals have to be achieved and so underneath each of these goals like goals for health they put certain targets 
Uh, so that is the way it works normally. You set goals and you put targets and then you hope that you will achieve them. And so it helps the world to talk together uh, on some of these developments. So if you're in the educational sphere, you talk about uh, the educational targets. The sustainable development goal for health is sustainable development goal number three. Can we have the next slide? And so they said, compared to these millennium development goals, we want the new goals, we want them to be a more action oriented, target oriented, with more impact. And we want things to be more integrated. And so because people had realized that everything hangs together with everything else. Uh, if you work in health, of course, you're interested also in water, you're interested in food, you're interested in education, you're interested in climate, uh, because all these things have an impact on health as well. Uh, but if you work in education, you're also interested in health and you're interested in food and you're interested because uh, people need to know about these things. So they made these goals now really as a family of goals. And now with the COVID, what is very, very clear is that this very strong uh, set of agendas uh, for the world, that this now might be very helpful uh, to, to do the fast tracking of some of these things we talked about earlier, uh, like moving to planetary health. Planetary health is in a way nothing else than bringing all these goals that are related to health together with the health goal number three. And say, let's move on this. Uh, because we see now that if, for instance, our ecosystems are destroyed, animals start to behave wild, weird, viruses jump from animals to humans and people get ill. Yeah? But we also see if people get ill and they have to close borders, it will impact on the economy and it will impact on food production and it will impact on... So the COVID has made extremely clear that everything hangs together. And so the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda that was actually developed in Kama year 2013-14 and then adopted by the UN in 2015, now it has become really foregrounded because everybody says here is where we see how things hang together. So the awareness that this is all one set of interrelated agendas has become very big. Now, again, for you guys working in global health, so you can also pick your choice. And so if in the future you say, well, my interest is in health and nutrition, or my interest is in health and giving better information, to people and you know, so I want to work on education a bit or my interest is in planetary health and I want to work on ecology and health this is now being much more foregrounded and so this is why I think the people who did not yet know about this like the human uh, human rights uh, agenda this sustainable development goals agenda is extremely important for your work and uh, whatever you're going to do in the future so this, I think, I wanted to, to really stress. Now, I want to click to all the slides that follow Jan to get to the final slide, if I may. So, click, click, click. So, you see, I have a lot of on the SDGs for people who want to read and on the universal health coverage for people who want to read more. You can just look at these slides. And this is the last I want to quickly now touch on before we stop in one minute. So if you say, okay, I'm a young doctor, I still have to finish my medical studies, I want to do something in global health. Use your time as a student also to start reading already about these broader contexts, and like the global health agenda, the global goals, etc. And then pick an area that, you, that is close to your personal interest. So even if you want to become a clinician, you might want to become a clinician in an area where there's a lot of issues, for instance, with vaccination or with medical technology. Now, start to work on these things right now. Uh, because the more you do with your young brains, the better. As you get my age, the brain becomes a bit slower. So do as much as you can. And then look, I would recommend from my own sort of enthusiasm, I would actually recommend you look at planetary health and the area of decolonizing global health. Because that is uh, the planetary health is really about the future. And decolonizing global health is to get rid of all the stuff that prevents things from happening. Uh, so old attitudes, things that stop people from moving in the right direction. So those two agendas, if you go online, you find people of your own generation all over the world working on this now. Uh, and this is, I think, um, if I were you and I had your uh, allergy, I would actually immediately go there and, and focus your global health interest um, after getting familiar with what this is all about. So I want to leave it here. I hope this was a little bit useful. 
Um, sorry that because of not being physically together, we cannot interact more, but I hope it was not too boring. So over to you, Jan. Okay, Gordelieve, thank you very much. Um, it was great having you as, uh, as always. Uh, and I know from, from earlier years that most of the time after your lectures, there was a lot of conversation, a lot of discussions uh, in the lecture hall with the students, uh, which perhaps we can do online now, but which is of course much more And that's my email address. And, uh, in the slides, the yeah. email is there. So if people want to mail, uh, no problem, as long yeah. as it's not 100 people at, at once. Okay. And either they can email me as well uh, to, uh, to forward potential questions to, uh, to you and to discuss that with you as well. So are there questions now? I just put a, a remark in the, in the chat box about the Climate Change Planetary Health Masterclass by Andy Haynes in uh, the end of this month. Um, so that's at least some part we, uh, we tackle. Um, and we have some decolonization stuff by Gertjan van Stam uh, uh, on his African uh, culture uh, lecture, which will be, I guess, next week, Thursday. So we do something about that as well. Are there any questions, remarks, urgent things you want to discuss now? It's been nearly two hours, so we can also call it a day. And if you want to chat or uh, email with Gaudelieve, the email address is uh, in the chat box. So, uh, Gaudelieve, anything to end with? No, just to, to reiterate, it's, it, it is always nice to talk physically with people afterwards. But basically, guys, um, go for it. Um, I, I'm actually, in a strange way, optimistic that after this, this COVID, things will actually turn out to be better. But we, we're, we're the change. Yeah? We really need to do, do it in part ourselves. Uh, but there's so many real good opportunities for also for people of your generation to find interesting work and, and interesting ways to develop. So um, don't be pessimistic by a little bit of confinement. We'll get over it. Okay, thanks for the positive note, uh, then, uh, as always, again. Okay, thank you very much. We see each other for the ones who do the pod and the vidcast this afternoon. Uh, and otherwise, coming Monday, uh, again, nine sharp. See you then. Have a nice weekend.